Um, I need slides because I open my mouth and my brains fall out, so I need some structure. My brains are still going to fall out, but at least they'll fall out in a more structured fashion. So I'm going to talk about open educational resources for the next five to seven minutes, and there's so much I could talk about, say about them, but I'm going to have to rush through. Okay, so straight into the definition. Here's the, um, they've been on the go for about 20 years, a bit longer, like other aspects of open scholarship they're taking off at the moment and they are kind of more established in North America and there's more um, more reasons for that in terms of um, access to textbooks and textbooks cost and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that briefly but here's a good um, definition from UNESCO the salient points bolded learning and teaching materials educational materials in any medium. They reside in the public domain or being released under an open license. And the open license is important. I'll talk about that shortly. That open license that permit reuse, redistribution and adaptation with no or limited restrictions. And the adaptation point is important because it means that you can adapt other people's work. Other people create a resource. They make it available they give you permission to adapt it so you can you can adapt it for your own use. An example that's important to me at the moment, which which I, I, I want to follow up on is there's a Canadian OER site which has some open access, open well, open educate OER textbooks for craft apprentices, so the electrical textbooks, plumbing textbooks and, and such like. Now you couldn't use them here because there's different systems and different regulations and different, you know, electrical standards but you could take those textbooks and you could take out the canadian bits sp specific to canada and you could plug in bits which are relevant to ireland and you could use that textbook straight away so open licensing um most commonly used open licenses are those of creative commons who are our non -pro international non-profit organization who are interested in sort of releasing knowledge from behind paywalls and making it freely accessible. These are really good licenses and there's various things you can do. You still maintain copyright, but you can fight tune the rights that you give up, and the, the rights that you maintain, so you can make your um, material available to, to be reused and readapted. You can make it avail available, reused and readapted, but you must, um, people who do that must um, share alike. They must, um, they can't change the licenses. So here's an example just to stress that your copyright is retained. This is copyright 2020 by Galway and Roscommon Education Training Board, but um, it allows you to retain, reuse, copy, redistribute, and revise in part as long as the author is attributed. So I use, I'm going too fast here. Trying to get everything through in five to seven minutes. Why why use OERs? Well, a big driver has been cost. Um, you know yourself, some of you will be in um, you know, the ebook SOS campaign in the UK. Ebook prices are just too damn high. Not everything's available. And frankly, we've been ripped off by publishers. Publishers are also selling direct to um, students rather than libraries, but disintermediation there. So um cost is important, particularly in America, where um textbooks, uh, cost of textbooks are acts as a gateway to whether you do a course or not. Um, surveys been done by public research groups finding that you know, students will, and a large number of students will choose not to take a course because the, the cost of textbooks are prohibitive, basically. Um, they're easier to manage. You, um, Some of you will be involved in electronic resource management, and you know the hoops that some of your users have to jump through to get access to a a resource, well, open educational resources one click away. They're, they're, they're not licensed, so you don't have to worry about who's actually accessing them. In fact, the more the merrier. Um, the bespoke, they, they give you the opportunity to customise. If you're teaching a module in, I don't know, much, something absurd like um, trout fishing in medieval Denmark, you might have books covering Denmark. Med medieval history or trout fishing in general, but you wouldn't have something specific to that. So you can write that, which you can then share with other people who are teaching modules in trout fishing in medieval Denmark. They're dynamic. They're easily changed. You can, you can adapt them. You can, you can, it's easier to adapt them because mostly electronic. If you're making changes to commercial textbook, boom, there's another edition, 99.99, which is recommended for all your courses. You end up with about 15 different editions of, in hard copies in your library unless you're actively reading them. There's more opportunities for equity. The, the cost aspect, they're free, more or less. You can make them available to everyone. Um, every, lifelong learning 
big thing for members of the public. You have the likes of MIT, who have a site, Open Courseware, where they make all their educational, their, their course material available for free for through a Creative Commons license, and anyone can access these. So the lifelong learning aspect is good. Diversity and inclusion, you can you can change the resources to, to better fit your cultural or geographical aspects. Um, you can make them more inclusive via accessibility. You can even have your students as learners, as co-authors, and they promote collaboration and creativity. If there's 16 different modules on trout fishing in Denmark and Irish education institutions, you can get together with you other people who are teaching these and you can write, make one resource that will cover all a um, few challenges as well. Quality might be an issue. You don't have access to maybe to all the, the resources that commercial publishers have. So yours might be a, a bit rough and ready and it's not maybe not been peer reviewed. Maybe it should be um, understatement of the year. Copyright's not well understood by everybody. Um, very confusing. This is an area where libraries can come into. Copyright librarians, we can explain to folk. Uh, educate folk about Creative Commons as licenses. Technology is a big issue. You've got to make things accessible. You've got to make things um, available in open file formats. You've got to make them platform independent. I work in the FET sector, and um, a lot of learners in the FET sector use mobile phones to access the internet and you know, the course materials. So you, you've got to take these folk into account. You've got to, make, got to keep things simple. Big, big reason for using OERs. Um, this is a study from uh, about 10 years ago. I think there's more recent, there's lots of more recent work, but this is a very nice abstract which lends itself to display in presentations. It's comparing courses using OERs and non OERs in the same university, and the courses that used OERs, students better retention and better outcome use them. Um, so, OERs are born digital. You're not pounding away at a typewriter and then taking them to a printing press. So you can do all sorts of things, e-books, e print books, videos, podcasts, the sky's the limit. You can make all sorts of things available, data sets even, as Rhoda was talking about earlier, actual lessons, lesson plans, assessments. The sky's the limit. I mean, limited by your imagination, perhaps. Um, big difference between OA and OER is that OER should be dynamic, you can change them, you can revise and adapt them, OA just released. You can share and redistribute and use, but you can't adapt or change an OER or an OA resource. Um, we have to find them. Lots and lots of uh, repositories and search engines now. Here's here's four, Melo, um, OpenStax, OER Commons, and uh, Met OER MetaFinder. Um, Melo has a really um, neat tool whereby you can enter the ISBN of a textbook and Melo will return a open equivalent of that textbook. How cool is that? Um, here's the resource, OER resource I've been involved in. Say I work in the FET sector. We have lots of further education and training. We have craft apprentices. Um, so there's quite lots of maths tutors in the FET sector. There's a sectoral apprenticeship support group who um, help with um, apprentices who need assistance with our literacy and numeracy. So put together a series of um, workbooks introducing mathematics, how to use a calculator, um, basic arithmetic, an introduction to um, things like algebra and trigonometry, which might be needed in specific crafts. So these, these, these um, some of these were in existence, but they were very much for internal use only, and you wouldn't release them to um, the public. Uh, the public. So one of the things, I, I proofed them all with a fine tooth comb and I wrote a series of style and standard guidelines so that they, they could all look the same. And I made them available through the ETI Digital Library and they're also available on OER Commons, which you briefly saw a screenshot of. And they're released with a Creative Commons license. And I'm really um, putting, currently putting together a sort of a framework, sort of checklist for other folk in the FET sector who want to release their sources open access. And I'm really excited to be part of that because it can be a huge growth area. So what can librarians do in terms of OERs? Well, lots of things we can lead. We can certainly we can advocate and explain why OERs are a good thing. We can get involved in um, various ways. We all have a common library skill set. We're all good at 
stamping dates on books and saying shush to, shush, shush to our patrons. But we all have we all have common skill sets. We all have our own skill sets. I, I'm really good at proofreading and all that. I'm really shite at marketing, but other people are good at marketing and selling stuff. You can get involved in a number of ways. And I think librarians do a lot of teaching. So, I mean, maybe we could get together and produce our own um, OERs for help with um, you know searching databases or info or digital literacy, how to avoid plagiarism, lots of things. Um, there's also um, three postgraduate LIS courses on the island of Ireland, and I'm thinking a bit of a pipe dream, but what if these folk got together and collaborated on OERs to use in their courses? I mean, OERs are going to happen anyway. They're taking off in a big way. There's um, today and to yesterday, there's been a, you know, a big OER conference, conference going on. People from Ireland are involved. So they're going to happen. And I think this would be a huge growth area for librarians to get involved in. We're good people. We're skillful people. And we're good at what we do. And we can enhance these projects. And say, I think it's a, a great growth area for libraries. Well, I think I've spoken, well, might be over time. I'm not sure, but I've spoken. I've told you everything I want to tell you. And... Thank you for listening.